So hi guys. Uh, uh, today our speaker is Professor Chetan Krishnan from Center of High Energy Physics, IIC Bangalore. He's going to speak about hints of gravitational ergodicity, uh, Berry's ensemble, and the universality of semi-classical page curve. And this is based on his three recent works, which is pointed in the first light. And this is the 77th QSTM Zuminar. And, uh, uh, thank you, Chetan, for agreeing to give this talk for QSTM. And uh, we, we are very hopeful to learn a lot of new things today from you. And we are welcoming you to give this talk. So you can start. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't know how much you will learn, but uh, I can try. So, um, yeah. So as I was saying, if there's any question or something, just feel free to interrupt rather than raise hands or anything. Okay, so uh, so the yeah the title of the talk is uh, hints of gravitational ergodicity, and it's uh, roughly in the context of this recent papers and you know the recent works in the last one one and a half years um, on the um, well I mean more than more than one and a half years uh, almost two years maybe well uh, on the information paradox and its semi-classical resolution. So um, and my work will basically can you see the the, the my cursor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So okay. So um, so this this is this talk is almost entirely based on this uh, paper that I recently put out, and uh, so there are some other papers that I've written recently on information paradox, but they cover various different aspects. There are multiple questions. I mean, you know, that have kind of opened up because of this, and so there are a few different directions. I would say that these three papers address a slightly different line than this one. And this is the one that I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, so yeah. So, so Vaishnav was my collaborator there, and I especially have to mention that his, uh, you know, contributions in this paper was especially, he, you know, like somehow he really ran with it. And multiple times I felt that the project might not uh, get completed, but he was uh, really kind of like a powerhouse behind it. So that's the reason why the paper exists. Okay, so let me uh, start by uh, saying a few words about uh, the information paradox, the general context of the information paradox. And I'm sure that you have heard multiple times about this, but nonetheless, I mean, uh, let me present my point of view on it. So there are many questions of increasing subtlety which go by the phrase of uh, information paradox. And uh, so this involves things like reconstructing, you know, knowing uh, the, the interior of the black hole. And uh, that's one kind of question that you could ask. But in some sense, the most basic question that you could ask in the context of the information paradox is the question of uh, the unitarity of black hole evaporation. And this is the version that Hawking originally um, phrased, even though his original version is generally you know, it's not quite, the, it, it's, it doesn't really qualify to a paradox the way he phrased it, but we will still refer to his, his version, uh, you know, the, the unitarity question as, as his version of the paradox. So uh, the rough idea is that, you know, black holes basically radiate as though they were thermal states. Once it has formed, it has a temperature and it can radiate. And so it becomes difficult to understand what happened to the detailed information of the initial quantum state that collapsed to form the black hole. And of course, Many, many things become thermal and many, you know, even in a, a burning piece of coal, you find you know, temperature and uh, uh, thermal states and so on. But uh, so what is so special about a black hole that causes this uh, or causes the information paradox? And the basic answer to that question is the surface of a black hole is structureless. And that's what makes it so difficult to understand what the information, why, why, uh, what, what happens to the information that falls into the black hole. So in the case of a surface of a piece of coal, there is a lot of structure at the surface of the coal. So which means that whatever is being radiated is sort of a signature of uh, what is there on the surface. So the information on the surface can be carried away by the radiation, but because a black hole is supposed to have a smooth horizon in the sense that there is nothing happening at the horizon, it's a, you know, a principle of equivalence is expected to hold up the horizon. So because of which you end up having this difficulty that somehow the black hole is becoming smaller and smaller, but there is no real information that is being radiated from the hairless surface of a black hole. So, and so then it becomes a puzzle very late in, uh, during the evolution, what happened to the stuff that fell into the black hole? There you go. So that's roughly the information paradox in one way of phrasing it. Um, and uh, 
So we'll phrase a slightly sharper version of the paradox, and that's the context that we will talk about. And so before uh, we go into that, um, this problem must have a solution if ADS CFT is true, because ADS CFT we believe is a quantum theory of gravity, and CFT is uh, the CFT is a unitary theory. Okay, so um, so this is the most bare bones answer. It doesn't it doesn't give you a mechanical explanation of how the information paradox is solved, but it does tell you that there should be a mechanism if ADS CFT is true, which is because the whatever the process of black hole formation and evaporation is in the bulk of ADS, it should be the case that the dual process should have a translation in terms of CFT observables. And in the CFT is a unitary theory, so we expect that there is um, there should be a resolution. So the question of where did Hawking semi-classical bulk intuition go wrong or, or some version of it, because as I said, Hawking's calculation not quite directly qualifies as an information paradox, but we will loosely refer to that as Hawking's information paradox. Uh, so where did the semi-classical bulk intuition, that the surface of the black hole is smooth and it keeps radiating, um, and how does that get clarified by ADS CFT is not very clear. Um, we only have, at best, we have a CFT understanding of processes uh, which are duals of black holes. We don't really have a bulk understanding of what happens. So and that's uh, one way to understand. Uh, the pro why it is still not a resolved question, fully resolved question, what the information paradox, how the information paradox works. So uh, this is because, um, so, so one of the reasons why it is difficult to understand this in the CFT, from an ADS CFT, is because an implicit part of Hawking's semi-classical calculation is the picture that the black hole is a bulk localized system. And that's very important that it is a bulk localized system. So in flat space, in flat space or in ADS. And so the problem with ADS, you know, pro the trouble with ADS CFT is that in, it is the natural observables of ADS CFT are integrals over all of space time because uh, quantum gravity, the bulk diffeomorphism invariance is a gauge invariance. So you would, so the only natural observables that you have are integrals over all of space time. So which means that your natural observables are only to be found at the boundaries of your integration, which are the boundaries of space time. And so those different variant observables are typically what you can think of them as CFT correlation functions. And these things live at the boundary. So the natural question of what happens or the, the bulk localized dynamics is always a challenge for ADS CFT to understand from the CFT point of view. And that's one way to see why it is that Hawking's calculation is a Hawking's uh, problem, Hawking's information paradox is a challenge for ADS CFT. And that's, it's important that it is a bulk localized system. So uh, the black hole is a bulk localized system. Okay, so uh, one can elevate Hawking's implicit assumption that, uh, uh, one can elevate Hawking's implicit assumption that, uh, one second. Yeah, so one can elevate Hawking's implicit assumption that black holes are localized object into an explicit assumption and in fancier language, what that means is that uh, we split the Hilbert space into two possibly approximate tensor factors and imagine the black hole is living in one. Then one can ask more generally how the entanglement entropy of the subsystem uh, should evolve if degrees of freedom are steadily leaving the subsystem into the rest of the system. This will be the crudest possible model for Hawking radiation that one can imagine. So the result is interesting because the overall shape of the space curve is very general and it relies only on our assumption that the system contains two pieces that, and that it is quantum mechanical. Okay, so what it differs from uh, Hawking's uh, calculation, so it differs from uh, Hawking's uh, result because it is predicated on the horizon, in, on, it, it, because it's, his calculation is predicated on the horizon being smooth throughout. So there is apparently no information in the outgoing radiation. Okay, so this is the page curve version of the Hawking paradox. And this is a much more robust and sharp version of the paradox because there is really no escaping it. So, and I will explain what I mean by that. So, um, so, uh, so page curve brings out a more detailed manifestation of the violation of unitarity by emphasizing that Hawking's implicit assumption that black holes can be localized in the bulk. This is because uh, now we have a curve to shoot for, and not just a yes-no statement about unitarity. And if you're trying to resolve the information paradox, this is kind of a useful thing to have. And equally importantly, at the page time, when we expect the turnaround, the black hole is still macroscopic. And that's a crucial point. Okay, so, if the, if the, so if one could, in principle, hope that, you know, if the whatever fell into the black hole maybe fell inside the singularity or something, 
and you could hope that some uh, there was a way in which you need not have you, one need not worry about the information because it is somehow exterior of the black hole uh, exterior of a large black hole which is always macroscopic and so you need a semi classic the problem is visible at the semi classical level and that's why it is a challenge so operationally the difference between hawking's expectation and the and page's curve happens because hawking's version of the entropy calculation treats the entanglement entropy as entirely due to um, ingoing and outgoing qft modes in the bh black hole background this can only relentlessly increase uh, as more and more are emitted because the emission is always as i keep emphasizing happening from a smooth vacuum like horizon and this entanglement entropy is sometimes called s bulk okay so um, one can think of s bulk as the entanglement entropy of the bulk quantum field modes that have left the black hole subsystem example ads when ads is coupled to a sink to extract radiation so the question is can we somehow modify this bulk prescription for entanglement entropy to get the right page curve and that's the question that was recently found an answer in the natural prescription for it note that without modifying the prescription for entropy this problem cannot really be solved in the way that it is phrased so and this entropy problem was is what has recently been solved so the basic idea is that you know beckenstein had this old idea that the entropy of quantum last one thing so yeah modifying this bulk this is yeah. the, like the island idea and all this so yeah why this this is coming recently why not people have tried for a long time why suddenly it yeah, in principle i think that's, that's an excellent question actually because i think that they could have done that long ago i think it is yeah. like you know it's uh, in principle for instance right after beckenstein's calculation so beckenstein always has been talking about the fact that you know quantum field theory entropy uh, should be should have been uh, modified by the area of the black hole by 4g right yes so that is the natural entropy that should that should go into the thermodynamic uh second law let's say and uh, so in that in that sense there is no real reason to have thought that this is this s bulk that is sitting here which is essentially a quantum field theory contribution is the only thing that one should have looked at so but uh, history has its you know it's on curvy path so people just did not think about it in that way and also i think the ads cft intuition and uh, how this quantum extremal surface was defined that's yeah, so sort like, of i have asked this yeah. question like well, because the idea of uh, this quantum extremal surfaces and uh, its application this is not so much fancy one yeah, can do that. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so i mean i think that so the one surprise maybe one could say is that so you know you so s bulk is like an order one quantity and you're going to correct it by a by 4g which is an order n square quantity in the ads cft large n count so it's a it's a very large correction so in that sense you know the correction that we are putting in is huge but that correction while it is huge has already been done by uh, you know beckenstein back in probably before all of us were born so it is not it is certainly the case that you know this was certainly not a, a super, uh, extremely mysterious idea and it's very interesting because you know the the way people got to this quantum extremal surface idea is very incremental so there was initially a paper by i think uh, all the same and a couple other collaborators i think faulkner and yeah. like lukovic and all that all those people where it was like an order one perturbative correction to the a by 4g and that you know to the ryuta kanagi formula and then it was this uh, engelhardt wall uh, basically came along and they just said that okay instead of adding an order one correction to an already existing rt surface why don't we add the order one correction and then do the extremization and that's yeah, yeah. the idea of quantum extremal surface and so the one thing that one might worry is that you know if because it's an order one correction this might never contribute to any substantive change in the rt surface and what has been shown to be that's not true essentially because even though the order one correction is small in principle you know as a if you are counting it in terms of the g newton or the n square parametrically it can become very large at at very large times and that's what happens in the case of the page curve because if you look at very late times at the page time for instance the the contribution to the order one term has been parametrically increasing as the black hole just keeps evaporating and evaporating and evaporating and so then at some point which is basically the page time that order one contribution can overwhelm the a by 4g contribution and that's so really how like, the page curve we can't call it like a fully perturbative correction it's a, 
uh, so, sorry, sir, can you say that again? I'm saying that this is not exactly like a perturbative correction to A by 4G. It's a, it's a perturbative correction in the parameter uh, G Newton, you know, perturbative in the sense yeah, that it is, uh, yeah, it's a, you can think of it that way. But, and it, it's, it's in that sense, it is, so, you know, it can be thought of as a semi classical thing. But what I'm saying is that the contribution, the order G, so order one correction, you know, the first term is one over G. The second one, the second term is order one, the, the S bulk contribution. And that term, okay. if you wait long enough, it becomes parametrically large. And that's how it overwhelms the first term in the case of, uh, um, you know, this uh, recent calculation. So in that sense, it is, yeah, it is perturbative. But the thing is that the quantity is, you know, you're looking at a large quantity at a late time. So, and yeah, so, I mean, it's the, the full object is, has its own natural definition. So it is a one by four G plus G plus that object is, has a natural definition in semi-classical gravity. And uh, yeah, so that's the idea. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so for the of. clarification. <laughs> Maybe I have asked <laughs> very sh like uh, elementary question. No, no, I mean, it's a, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an important question, I think. So, uh, yeah, I mean, at least that's like, my understanding. I used to I mean, ask this question many people, like <laughs> yeah. even Mathur also. Yeah, so, but I definitely agree with you that uh, it, sh it could have been thought of earlier. So, especially yeah, like, because, you know, see, especially for the specific like, case of... My feeling like is like this, this can be done before, not yeah. like... Yeah, and even without, so somehow, you know, maybe you could say that, okay, the RT surface requires an anchoring point and so ADS and so on and so forth. But like, you know, finally the, 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 the calculation, this calculation does not anchor the thing anywhere on the boundary. So it is for the entire boundary. So even the, it is really like an overall correction to the entropy. So that's something that one could have probably thought of if, uh, if you thought of it in terms of, you know, the S bulk needs a correction. So, yeah, but I guess the point is that people did not really think about it in terms of, uh, Entanglement entropy and yeah, I mean the culture was you know like yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. What can I say? <laughs> okay, you proceed. Yeah. So uh, in ADS CFT, the idea is that yeah. So this is what I was just saying. The entanglement entropy of a CFT subregion should be calculated by extremizing uh, this particular quantity. And this is not going to play a huge role in my talk today. So let me just flash this slide and go ahead because it's not very important for our purposes. So, yeah, I mean, if I was talking about one of my other talks, maybe this would have played a more prominent role. But so, uh, so the story is that uh, there is a specific combination of these things that can be defined, which is, uh, so note that this correction to the S-bulk that we are defining is a huge correction. So it is a one over G Newton, which means it's close as N squared. So, um, so, and this, so now you extremize this whole quantity and that quantity where the chi, now the extremal surface that you get is basically uh, the region inside that is what is called the entanglement wedge. And uh, so the entanglement wedge of the entire boundary ends up having a phase transition at the page time. And that is what is responsible for uh, the shape of the page curve is the uh, recent observation. And this is sometimes called the island description. If uh, anybody has you know, any question on that, I can explain that, but I guess you, know, you might have heard many talks on this already. So this is not such a, you know, this is not such a new thing anymore. So, so this is basically what is called the island prescription. So, and so, uh, so, so one can motivate this island prescription. So uh, by explicitly computing the entanglement entropy using the Euclidean path integral for gravity in simple theories. So the way you do is that you use this replica method for computing the so-called n through any entropy using uh, the semi-classical uh, gravity path integral, Euclidean path integral. And then we analytically continue to n equal to one. So I will just tell you the story here. And even this is, you know, like not quite the crux of my talk today. So uh, as long as you follow the story here, this is good enough. So what we are going to do is, uh, so yeah. So what the calculation is essentially that you do, uh, you can do a, pa a path integral computation of the Rennie entropy, uh, just like one can do it in the case of standard field theory. You can do it in se semi-classical gravity. <coughs> and uh, then for, uh, you compute it for n, then analytically continue to n equal to one. And if you find that uh, the, the QES formula, this island formula can essentially be reproduced by doing this. And this has been done uh, quite explicitly for in, in the case of simple theories. And uh, we find that uh, the natural page curve emerges and you can justify this island formula quite explicitly using semi-classical data. So this was done by both. You know, why JT gravity is so special? Why not any other two dimensional gravities? Like uh, Liouville, Liouville and all. So, so I think the one, so I think in principle, I think the key, the basic answer is that uh, in principle, I think you could do it for other theories. 
So, but the key point is that you would like it to be a theory in which there are genuine black holes. That's one thing. And the second thing is that the key ingredient for the calculation comes from these end of the world, world brains that are on the other, other side of the, you know, area. So one of the reasons why you, you would want JT gravity is because JT gravity allows you a very specific ADS black hole, which is in principle can be coupled to an external system. So it has, you know, a, a, a very a well controlled eternal black holes in it. So that's what makes it uh, a very uh, useful theory model. So, and there is a very natural understanding, for instance, for the dilaton, uh, the, the value of the sca scalar in uh, JT gravity has a very natural understanding in terms of uh, the value of the scalar has a very natural understanding in terms of you know, the, the entropy M by 4G and so on and so forth. So technically it's a very simple calculation, but and in higher dimensions, there are technical complications, but I think that the structure of the calculation is what is, should be taken away from here. And uh, so that's the message. And I will actually talk about some of the disadvantages of JT gravity. Because yes, JT gravity, in some sense, I think is a, in the higher is, dimension, is a bad uh, Myers and the, the collaborators probably have extended for higher dimensions, I think. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I think there are various people have extended it. I would say the first paper that really extends is a doubly holographic way of uh, doing this calculation. Uh, but also, so there's a couple of things to be uh, uh, distinguished. One is that uh, JT gravity, what they're really trying to obtain is basically a derivation of the island prescription. Okay, so from a direct uh, bulk calculation of this thing. But then there are doubly holographic prescriptions of computing these things. And that was, you know, in higher dimensions, it was first done by uh, uh, Almayri, uh, Mahajan and Santos. And uh, I'm not exactly sure, I, you know, Myers has a few papers on this. Maybe he has some papers where he deals with, the, I think, yeah, I do, I do think he has some papers dealing with these higher dimensional settings. But the first calculation, and I would say the first non-trivial calculation that really demonstrated the existence of islands in higher dimensions was this paper by Almayri, Mahajan, and Santos. Yeah, so that's the, but that's the important difference there is that that's a doubly holographic calculus. What I'm talking about here is that there is a direct frontal attack on the Euclidean gravity thing where you can compute the um, the you know the I, we, essentially you can think of this as a derivation of the island formula in the bulk very sort of directly for but for a toy model but not for uh, the really uh, interesting higher dimensional settings and I'll actually say some of the disadvantages of JT gravity as you as we go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so JT gravity is a rare case. So the interesting thing about JT gravity is in some ways that it is a fully well defined calculable metric pattern. So most of the time, metric path integrals are not well defined because in higher dimensions, for instance, the, met, the, 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 the conformal mode of the metric has a negative sign and you know, the integral, the path integral is not well defined and all that kind of thing. So, but in the case of JT gravity, it is a completely well defined metric path integral. But the, um, so uh, yeah, so that, that's one use of using uh, uh, JT gravity. So, uh, but yeah, so, so this, these results, while resulting in the page curve are puzzling. So this might, even though I said that it is a derivation of the island formula uh, using semi-classical gravity, they are somewhat puzzling. So one reason for the puzzle is that we are able to compute the page curve in the semi-classical metric based. Back in the day, I think people used to assume that because entanglement entropy is a fine-grained information and not some sort of, uh, you know, it's not, it, it is not a coarse-grained quantity. It's not a thermodynamic entropy people just used to assume that this is something that is difficult to obtain or impossible to obtain from uh, a semi-classical gravity. And somehow we used to assume that the, the true density matrix of the quantum gravity uh, would be necessary in order to compute. it. So, but that is what has, you know, in hindsight, I don't think this is a really sharp objection. And the reason is that even though it is a, it's a fine grained quantity, it is just one number. And the page curve is only really keeping track of the certain qualitative behavior of that number. It's not really telling you, you know, we don't really know whether the precise entanglement entropy that we are computing is exactly the entanglement entropy that one, one might get from the, the fine-grained uh, density matrix or the fine-grained entanglement entropy. But what we do know is that this semi-classical object that is calculating is a good tracker for the ultimate underlying behavior of this, uh, of this entanglement entropy. And it's just one number. A density matrix is a matrix. It has, you know, uh, uh, the rows times columns number of uh, elements, but the entanglement entropy itself is just one number. So which means that in principle, you know, something coarse grain like semi-classical gravity might be able to keep track of it. In fact, we will see that this is one of the, one of my points in the talk is that this is a much more general feature. Any semi-classical 
you know, semi-classical approximations of unitary quantum mechanical theories can actually reproduce the page curve even if they don't have access to the true density matrix. This is one of the things that I will actually demonstrate in, uh, in, the, in, in my talk. It's, it is not even a property of gravity. So, so the structure of the result provides strong hints that the, so the second problem is I would say a more serious problem, which is that the structure of the result provides strong hints that what the semi-classical metric path integral is calculating is an ensemble average. So this, you have to actually look at their paper to see that this is a natural interpretation, but it turns out that that is the case that if you look at their uh, results, the, the, the result that you're getting has the, the, the smells like an ensemble average. And uh, then it, it becomes a bit of a puzzle. Why is it that an ensemble average seems to be arising in a theory, which was underlying theory was supposed to be a unitary theory. So after all, we started out in this process by trying to understand why unitarity, a unitary theory can, you know, we wanted our whole goal was to get the unitarity compatible page curve because we sort of thought that the quantum gravity is a unitary theory. And now on the other hand, we get the unitary theory, but it looks like we have, we have it in the context of an ensemble average theory. So what does that mean? So it's a kind of a puzzling scenario. So what, what, how do you make sense of it? And in fact, this is what I was saying was JT gravity is kind of a weird example. And JT gravity can be rewritten very explicitly as a sum over an ensemble of matrix models. So this is an explicit rewriting of uh, the path integral in terms of new variables. And you can directly do it and uh, this is a variable change. So, and so it's, it looks like the theory is most certainly an ensemble average. And uh, it's an ensemble average of unitary theories, certainly, but it's not a single unitary theory. And this is maybe not surprising because the metric path integral is well-defined. And metric path integral, when they, in the case of standard gravity theories, we know it's not a well-defined metric uh, you know, path integral. So, uh, this is, so this is an explicit demonstration that uh, this theory that we at least used has an explicit uh, ensemble average in it. And uh, so the claim is that, that somehow in higher dimensions, there is in fact, a, in fact there are higher dimensions where there is, you know, in the case of, for instance, like say, n equal to four super Yang mills, we expect that there are single realizations of unitary theories, which should be dual to quantum gravity theory. So what is going on? So this is kind of a thing that is quite puzzling. Yes, so this is the, so, is, so the full quantum gravity can, uh, is to be understood as an ensemble average. Is that what the message is? If you take JT gravity at face value, or is it, uh, it seems puzzling and confusing to view a fundamental theory of nature as an ensemble of quantum theories, even though I'm not very sure whether people have tried to make it into a sharp contradiction, whether you know, an ensemble of theories can, you know, is probably already in contradiction with something we already expect from nature. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it is probably worth making it into a precise statement. And I think it is probably not, um, you know, impossible to do. Um, I don't think it is, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it's just a question of asking some questions, of, or some sufficiently precise questions. And I don't think it is inaccessible. But I don't think people have tried to really make it into a sharp contradiction. But uh, so the, the, it seems a little bit strange to think that our universe is not one theory, but many theories, and somehow we are doing an ensemble average in some sense. It seems a little bit weird at the outset, but on the other hand, quantum mechanics is a weird theory, so maybe this can also fly. So, but the more direct problem, in my opinion, is basically that in higher dimensions, we do know that there are theories of uh, perfectly unitary theories we expect to be dual to uh, gravity theories. So, why, if for instance, n equal for super Yang is uh, dual to uh, string theory on you know, some ADS background, so why is it that, or how is it that we are going to understand such theories? Because those things need an understanding too. We expect that there are black holes in these theories. You know, a thermalized state in n equal for super angles should be a black hole from the dual picture. And I don't see a way in which we can escape that. And there is no ensemble in sight. So, uh, so clearly we need to understand this in some setting in order for us to uh, make sense of uh, uh, this ensemble average. So if, if this ensemble average picture that people have discovered is in some sense supposed to be explanatory or descriptive of real gravity, then we need to be able to put those things in the context of a single realization of a unitary theory. And that's the way in which we can possibly try to make progress. And that's the kind of thing in which I'm trying to, uh, I thought I will try to uh, uh, work on today. So, so, um, and so the, the, the reason why it is difficult to answer these puzzles directly in higher dimensions is because the precise connection between the full quantum gravity, and by that I mean the CFT, and the semi-classical metric-based bulk description is one of the least understood aspects of the ADS-CFT correspondence. 
So we know how to map from bulk things to boundary things when the bulk things are taken to the boundary and there is some uh, field operator correspondence and so on. But precisely how to get the bulk description directly from a CFT description is not clear. So there is, this is the problem of bulk locality and it's a difficult problem that has been there ever since the formulation of um, ADA CFT. We are making uh, significant progress on it in the last, let's say four or five years, uh, maybe even a decade. Uh, but it is still, it's still essentially, you know, this particular problem is still inaccessible. So, so what I will try to do in this talk is that in order to get some insight on the origin of a semi-classical page curve and an ensemble averaged page curve is that we, we can try to answer, ask the same question. You know, are there any non-gravitational unitary systems where we can see the unitarity compatible page curve arising semi-classically and do ensemble averaging, do, does ensemble averaging play any, play any role at all? So this is a question that we can ask. So instead of, because the reason why this is a viable question to ask is because the question that we are trying to address has nothing to do with the information balance. Okay, so the question that we are trying to understand is the semi-classical origin of the page curve and the, the need for ensemble averaging in getting that page curve. That, those are the questions that we are trying to understand. And they have not, those have nothing to do with the presence of horizons or the information paradox. So in principle, if we can try to understand them in the context of a completely non-gravitating system, in principle, we could learn something as a, maybe we could extract that as a general lesson and that might tell us something about uh, what, what it has to say about gravity. So yeah, so then if you have, if you can find such a non-gravitating system, then we can have reasonable confidence that the true quantum gravity is unitary and that the ensemble averaging is an effective feature of the semi-classical approximation. So let's say you could find uh, a, a non-gravitating quantum theory where you could find in a single realization of a, uh, of a theory, you could find ensemble averaging in a semi-classical approximation and you ended up with a unitarity compatible page curve, then that would be an argument for believing that uh, this is uh, not a particular, particular complication of gravity, but just a general feature of uh, strongly coupled systems. Um, and that would be some sort of a progress. So, and again, I, let me emphasize that the reason why this is a meaningful thing to try is because these two questions that I'm trying to understand, even though they arose first in the context of the information paradox have nothing to do with the information paradox. So, and that's the reason why it is a worthwhile thing to try and do in the context of a non-gravitating theory. Okay. So, so then the question arises. So if once you, uh, so any questions on the philosophy? If, uh, is that acceptable? So any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, so if there are no questions, so the, so the thing that we would, so what we would like to figure out where exactly, in what kind of a non-gravitational system can one expect this sort of a behavior? And the, a natural guess is when the system is strongly quantum chaotic. Okay, and the reason for that is that we expect that quantum chaotic systems to ex ex exhibit thermalization uh, via what is known as the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So we, and the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, as you will see, has, uh, as I will explain in the next slides, will have uh, various aspects of uh, information paradox in them. Okay, so that's the, so that's the, um, that's, that's the thing that we would like to understand. So, uh, okay, so 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 what we are going to look at for, look for a, uh, a for a quantum chaotic system, hopefully with a nice classical understanding. That's another important point. We want a quantum system with a nice classical understanding because we will we hope we suspect that semi-classical physics will play some sort of an important role, and we want it to be a quantum chaotic because then we expect that eigenstate thermalization might play a role. So, in short, what we would like is a system which is the quantization of a classically chaotic system. That's the system that we can look at, which might teach us something about the origin of ensembles and semi-classical page curves. This is the system that we would like to look for. Okay, so, okay, so, the, so the system that I'll pick is the simplest possible uh, system that one has both these features, and it is basically what is called the hard sphere gas. Okay, so the hard sphere gas is basically an object which is, uh, is, a, is a system, is a classical system which is known to be chaotic and which has, so which has played a role in discussions of eigenstate thermalization and, 
and it, it, so I'll consider a hard sphere gas localized in a small box and then leaking out into a uh, uh, into a uh, into a bigger box. And this is my you know this is the system in which because the system is you know the particles are going from one place to the other. We naturally expect that there is a page curve should be existing there, and our goal is to compute that page curve only using semi-classical methods. This is what we want to do. Okay, so this is to be uh, this is so this is the setup that we have. And for the hard sphere gas, the eigenstate ensemble, and I will clarify what that means again in a few slides, is that uh, the eigenstate ensemble is believed to be Gaussian, and the version of ETH, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, for the hard sphere gas is what is often called the Berry's conjecture. In fact, it was a motivation for the first formulation, clean formulation of eigenstate thermalization that uh, Sretniki wrote down in one of his papers. Okay. So uh, I will explain these uh, couple of words here, Berry's conjecture, what it means, you know, what exactly ETH means for my system, I will explain in the next couple of slides. So the moment it only matters that, you know, so there is a certain hard sphere gas in which a certain version of ETH called Berry's conjecture is expected to hold. So, and let me also make precise what I mean by slow leak. And uh, slow leak is kind of important for us because we will want, um, in, in, just as in the case of black holes, because black holes have you know, approximately well-defined black Hawking temperature. So, so if you have a well-defined Hawking temperature, what that means is that you know, even though the black hole is evaporating and it's a dynamical system, I, during each epoch of evaporation, you can associate a approximately constant Hawking temperature to it. And uh, so that's roughly the idea that the Hawking radiation is not, you know, the time scale for Hawking radiation is very slow compared to that of, let's say, the scrambling time of a black hole. So th that's one way to understand that. And so we want to engineer something similar so that we have an epoch in which we can follow the evolution of the page curve. And as epochs change, you know, we will hopefully expect to see the tent shaped page curve that uh, one, uh, you know, is expect one suspects we should find. So in order to arrange for a slow leak, what we'll do is that the hard sphere radius A, we will kind of adjust it to be approximately less than the size of the hole. Okay, so let's say there is two boxes that are separated. And then what we are going to, this first half is basically what ensures that there is a, um, you know, uh, there is a, small, a slow leak in the system. And if this is, you know, this is, uh, this, is a necess, this is a sufficient condition, but there are one, you know, there are multiple contexts in which I think you can actually consider you know, there are many situations where there is an approximate equilibrium hold when there is a small hole in the in a gas of uh, in a box full of gas. So, but this is one way in which you can arrange it. I think that you could probably have a similar situation even if A is substantially smaller than B. Uh, but I'm just interested in some particular configuration where a slow leak can be arranged. So, the second condition here is more, uh, you know, is it's somewhat more important in, or, or significant. Is, is the second condition is basically telling me the mean free path of the of the hard spheres inside the box, and the claim is that because the reason why I want it to be much bigger is because the calculations that I'm going to do, which are basically built on a calculation done by Sretniki back in '94, are basically based on uh, this. Uh, you know, so this is the this is the formula for the mean free path. I mean, you can look it up anywhere you want, and together with this statement, it basically tells me that. The, this is a low density system. And a low density system is where I can do my calculations uh, of the kind that uh, certainly it does uh, uh, without getting lost in uh, various technical complications. Okay, so that's, uh, so this, uh, this, this assumption is important for making the system trackable. Okay, so yeah, so as I was saying, the first inequality can, can in principle be relaxed further, but uh, yeah, so that's the first statement. So, so, um, so, we, so the next assumption, the next point that we want to make is that we'll also assume that we are working with sufficiently high energy, total energy for the system, so that Berry's conjecture applies. So what this really means is that uh, my, uh, so the thermal wavelength, so the, the de Broglie wavelength associated to the energy scale of the system is such that it is small enough to probe the structures in the microscopic structure. So this A, for instance. So my uh, thermal wavelength should be less than this A so that I have, so that's when, um, you know, the system, you know, so the, the quantum, the, the, that's the situation in which I expect eigenstate thermalization to really truly hold in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, in the sense that at least Berry's conjecture is supposed to be true in that regime. So I'll also assume that to be the case. So, um, so and finally, 
an epoch is a period during which the number of particles and uh, the you know the macroscopic descriptors of the system on one half of the box does not change appreciably and each box is in approximate equilibrium so uh, and our strategy would be that we will compute the nth renyi entropy for the reduced density matrix of the bigger box at each epoch and then we will use berry's conjecture to actually uh, evaluate this semi classically and we will be able to show that with if you uh, trace the evolution of this entanglement entropy as a function of the epoch you will actually find that there is a turnaround you will be able to get the the unitarity compatible page curve by doing this semi classical calculation yeah so so for as far as we are considered so the statement about berry's conjecture for us is basically just the statement that high lying eigen functions high lying means uh, my eigen functions which are sufficiently high energy the like i was mentioning before they are uh, they can be treated as gaussian random variables i'll there is a uh, i'll show that so this is uh, this is that this is equivalent to eth was shown by sretnicki and uh, yes yeah, so there is also papers by doish which were also from the same period and that's kind of the thing that sort of kick started the eigen state thermalization as a, as an idea okay so what i mean by uh, these are gaussian uh, these eigen functions are gaussian is well, the thing the crucial thing that i will need is the fact that in any expression that i have which involves multiple uh, wave functions i so for let's say for instance if we have a four point function four four wave functions are required and as you will see in my entanglement entropy calculations i will need these expressions okay so and these objects they basically factorize like if any gaussian object does it's basically wick theorem okay so for the wave function these are not correlators they do not mistake these things for correlators these are basically wave functions and uh, i am uh, computing for in my calculations these wave functions will show up and the claim is that as long as they are sufficiently high lying wave functions i can replace them by this sort of a replacement uh, in uh, assume uh, you know relying on the fact that in berry's conjecture these wave functions factorize so any questions okay uh, so sorry i have a small question yeah go ahead yeah so uh, in this system what do you mean by semi classical exactly yeah so for instance yeah you will see that actually so um, so so for you know uh, what i mean is that in order to have a macroscopic state i need to have well defined so for instance let's say that i i have i'm going to label each epoch by the number of particles in each box right so that's the way in which i'm going to label my system and that's already a semi classical approximation because if you have a general state in a multi particle system like let's say you have a state that corresponds to many you know some part one particle here one particle here something like that a linear super a combination of such a state with another state where the particles are somewhere else is also a perfectly acceptable state but that's not a semi classical state <laughs> so the point is that if i you know whenever i have some approximate notion of localization of particles that is an that's a semi classical uh, statement and in fact berry's conjecture uh, is actually phrased in terms of semi classical it is a, it is expected to be a semi classical sort of statement even though i as far as i can understand it has never been made super precise but the intuitive intuition behind this is sort of clear and the intuition what i mean by that is that you know your general superposition of arbitrary states are not what one discovers what one discusses in the context of semi classical approximation what you are thinking about is basically like uh, in uh, you know particles localized if you if if i want to think of the uh, of the system as somehow having two pieces where uh, you know the system is uh, in local equilibrium where one uh, box is yeah, has well defined number of approximate number of particles temperature volume all of those things macroscopic quantities then that basically uh, corresponds to a semi classical state so that's the picture that we are going to take okay so for instance uh, in this uh, for in like in this in what i'm going to write down now is the density matrix of my uh, of my full system which is psi of x comma y okay so so i will i will say what the semi classical approximation real corresponds to here corresponds to um so what it means is that if in principle so so let's say i'm looking at a specific epoch where there is you know n s number of particles on one box and n l number of particles on the other box and i can split my wave function in terms of the locations of the particles in the small box x and those in the large box y so note that 
when I say that the re range of X is restricted to one of the boxes, that's actually a semi-classical approximation. Because in principle, the particles can be anywhere in the full domain that I have defined. And the wave function is only expected to vanish at the boundaries of the box, where, you know, including, you know, the, uh, if there is a hole that is connecting the two boxes. And then there is, uh, you know, there is a two boxes sitting there. So only at the boundary of this uh, entire system where, you know, the, the, the hole is not part of the boundary, obviously. So that is, that's where the wave function is really expected to vanish. But on the other hand, if I have a semi-classical approximation where I say that Ns of these particles are supposed to be on the left side, then my, I am allowed to restrict my range of X to only the left box. So that's a semi-classical approximation. And uh, so this, this semi-classical approximation, so note that any time we make an assumption like this, we are going farther and farther away from the underlying fully unitary system. So all of these are approximations and uh, things that we are doing. And the interesting thing is that despite making these approximations that go farther and farther away from the underlying unitary system, we will actually be able to reproduce the phase curve. So that's what makes this approximation somehow non-vacuous. Okay, so we are looking at classical-like systems, but our density matrix of entanglement entropy that we calculate using that thing will actually have a standard tent-shaped phase curve structure. So this is my state psi of x comma y. I can define my density matrix, the full density matrix this way. And if I want to compute the density matrix, the reduced density matrix, I'll integrate over some of these y's. So if I am integrating over the y or the x, I will get a reduced density matrix corresponding to you know, one half of the system, the bigger or the smaller the box. Uh, does that answer your question? It's a little bit of a, yeah, it's a subtle point in fact. So I'm glad- Yes, yes, it does. It does. Okay, so as a warm up for this entanglement entropy calculation, uh, we'll compute the second Rini entropy. So I will show all my calculations in the case of, you know, this nth Rini entropies. And uh, so I will suppress, you know, like uh, you can uh, go look at our paper. So the higher order of this thing, higher order organization of these calculations actually, uh, diagrammatics is very similar to uh, the, the, the replica of Wormhouse calculation. So I, I'm not going to talk about that here. It's there in the paper. So, uh, so basically the point is that as a warm up for the calculation, you'll compute the second Rini entropy. And uh, you can, you know, this is basically just following from the direct definition of the object. And uh, the key point I want you to look at is only that there are four of these wave functions sitting here. Okay, so there'll be a, some, uh, some ugliness in the next coming slides. So the only thing I wanted to focus on here is that if I'm computing the uh, ensemble, so note that I'm also computing the ensemble average entropy at that epoch. I'm computing the ensemble average entropy because when the system is in local equilibrium, I can make this Berry replacement. Okay, so Berry's conjecture lets me uh, do this uh, ensemble replacement in order to compute the entanglement, uh, entanglement of any entropies. So, and, uh, so that's what I'm going to compute. So this is, there are four of these sides here and Berry, so this, at this stage I have gone into, I have made the replacement according to Berry. So what is this, this object here, I'm going to replace the four point function of this guy. And this structure is turns out is, is, is absolutely key in giving me the, the page curve structure. Okay, so this, is, uh, so this is the step in which I'm making the, so at this stage, I'm just saying that I'm going to replace it with the eigenstate or the Berry ensemble. But at this step, I have actually replaced with the, the conjecture that follows from Berry. So, and I have this particular expression. And now, I mean, of course, this expression is sitting there. I mean, how am I going to compute anything with it? And I will basically, so there is, I need one more. So this is the place where this, uh, so the, yeah, so this is the, this is the place where I'm basically approx. I mean, well, I mean, this is part of the places where, I mean, already I kind of in some sense assume that, but at each epoch, when the two boxes are in approximate equilibrium, we can make the assumption that the state psi, the generic state psi can be written in this form, where this psi and this phi are the eigenstate of the left box and the right box. And this C are generic um, arbitrary you know, linear superpositions. But the fact that the system is in equilibrium, in local equilibrium, both in the left box and the right box will guarantee that the index ranges for this IS are lying in a small sliver on the left box and also on, the, on a small sliver on the right box. They don't have to necessarily be at equal energies because the system, the total energy can differ as the system is evolving on both sides, but both sides are in separate equilibrium with each other, which basically means that there is a small sliver in which the IS will lie and there's a small sliver in which the IL will lie. And this is the semi-classical state that I can take 
to uh, when, when when I say that the system is in approximate local equilibrium at some epoch, that I can make this replacement for my state side. So, and the crucial point here is that this is an eigenstate of the left box. This is an eigenstate of the right box. So, okay, so this is the, this is essentially the assumption of local equilibrium. And uh, so, yeah, so this is again, another uh, crucial physical input. So the first one was the uh, Berry's ensemble type of thing. And this is the second input is the structure of the state that we are taking at each epoch. And uh, so, yeah, so that's basically that. So, okay, so, and now, I mean, you know, so now I plug this psi of xy into this expression here and, uh, you know, follow the, so, I mean, that, now this is just ugliness, but there is nothing really happening. So I just plug it in and expand, and then I get some expression like this. So uh, there's nothing really to follow. You don't have to really pay attention. So, but the key point is that, so the key point about this step is that at this step, I can use the known facts about equilibrization in uh, single boxes, which have been done, for example, in Sretniki's paper, and ap apply them for this calculation. And I end up finding, after a bunch of algebra, and uh, this again, you can find in the appendix and the, you know, the main text of our paper, you will find that the final expression for the, the for sort of a normalized uh, purity, the second Rennie entropy, has this form. Okay, So where I have defined all these various quantities that are showing up here. So I am suppressing a bunch of calculation here, but uh, I mean, you know, it's kind of just mess. There is nothing really important going on in any of these calculations. It's all like adapting Sretniki's work, but uh, nonetheless, I mean, if you have not seen it, it might be a little bit surprising to see these expressions. But uh, so, the, so the, the key point where the physics is going in is at this step here, where I'm putting in Berry's conjecture for the first time. And in this step here, where I have a semi-classical statement about the state at each ep epoch. And then this is again another step where I'm simplifying using the, the Berry's conjecture for each of the separate uh, small boxes. Okay, so I get a final expression like this, where all of these things, you know, the n prime stands for the number of particles in one box, n stands for the number of particles in the other box, h is just the Planck's constant. And I'm you know, working with distinguishable particles. It doesn't really matter. I can work with, uh, you know, I'm working with Boltzmann particles, but uh, it doesn't really matter. You can work with, uh, Fermi Dirac or any, any kind of particles that you like. So, but I'm working with hard sphere gas with Boltzmann. So that's explained some of these factors here. And uh, this is the energy of uh, the, so the, 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 the you know, so this is, this you can think of as an average energy of the state that shows up in this calculation. So, and uh, so, yeah, so these are some convenient definitions. And this rho tilde L is basically the, uh, the normalized reduced density matrices of these boxes and uh, the final form is this and this so you don't have to even pay attention to much of these things it's the crucial thing is that the structure here this trace rho l i l then there is a mixed term then there is rho s i s okay so the, the big box and the small box they come in separately and this structure is happening because of this particular factorization that i've taken so Berry's ensemble is actually Berry's conjecture is actually playing a crucial role in this final form that i'm getting here Okay, so uh, so that's the form that I get. Any questions? Okay, so I mean, anyway, there is really nothing. I mean, it's just algebra. And if you believe this final statement, the two physics assumptions are the ones that I mentioned here. Okay, so uh, yeah, so yeah, so so what we are going to do is we are basically going to compute uh, the you know this is just a purity, but we can also compute it for a general n. And for computing the general end, so you will have to kind of keep track of some diagrammatics, which I will not explain today. You can find it in the paper. Um, so, but the final answer is going to basically follow some kind of a, a page curve. Okay, so this is the promise I'm going to make. And in order to see that, let me basically, uh, so, so the, the calculation that now I'm going to do is uh, uh, outlining how exactly it happens. And so what happens is that, so, you know, so you can, uh, so this trace rho L I L that I told you about can actually be computed to be, so it, 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 you can define it to be this quantity, uh, you know, you, this, this right here at this stage is just a definition. So it doesn't really, nothing is happening, but you can check that in the large n limit. And when the sliver of the energy levels that you're looking at on each box is small, this U bar L is basically just the average energy of the box. Okay. So that's just something that you can explicitly check. So, and this basically gives you 
so which means that you can now you can use this formula this is the standard formula for the entanglement entropy which is just uh, this quantity here so i'm i'm basically just going to tell you what one can expect at early times and late times and you can trust me that if you follow this with uh, more detailed diagrammatics the, the the result doesn't change so if you look at the look at the expression for the this is the early time behavior of the entanglement entropy and you end up finding just by doing this calculation so the key observation is that at early times this object is much larger than this object okay so the dominant contribution is going to come from this first term and because of which you find that the entanglement entropy that you compute here basically you compute it and you find that this has this form okay so this is very similar to some thermodynamic quantities um, but yeah so this is the form that you get so this is the this is essentially the rising part of the page curve so this is the part that eventually leads to an information paradox if it is unchecked so this is the expression and uh, so and the interesting one of interesting observation is that you can actually do this you know you can connect it so in the when n is large this actually leads to a the thermodynamic entropy of the larger box okay so this is so at each so as the temper as at each epoch this is basically just a thermodynamic entropy of that uh, larger box and if it keeps rising we will run into trouble so so i'm go going a little bit fast through these things i'm just emphasizing the points because i'm running out of time because i think the main points that you need in order to reproduce things i've already mentioned the physics points so um, so the late time behavior here is uh, now we are concerned with the late time behavior and the key observation is that because of the structure of this particular expression that i have here at late times the dominant contribution is actually going to be this guy and that's related to the fact that the number of particles is increasing in the second box as time goes on okay so the so the late parts of the the late uh, behavior of this guy uh, of the same uh, entanglement entropy is actually controlled by the trace rho tilde sis and not by the trace rho tilde il and uh, there is a turnover point and in fact you can by explicitly plugging in some numbers you can actually see that you know right before and right after the page time this guy very sharply turns around so and this particular time is called the page time and if you look at very late times uh, or very late times or any time after the page time this quantity is less than this and you find that the entanglement entropy is actually the thermodynamic entropy of the smaller box okay so this is something that you find at later times and uh, yeah so this is by the way this is a fact so if you wait sufficiently long enough so 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 let me just emphasize this slide the next two slides are not very important so if you wait long enough the entanglement entropy of the second box is basically uh, so the entanglement entropy of the system um uh, is entanglement entropy of the bigger box is just the thermodynamic entropy of the smaller box and this is consistent with what one uh, expects from general arguments so in very general systems when the, whenever there is a, a system two uh, system which has been broken into two pieces and there is equilibrium between the systems be between the subsystems then there are general arguments can be used to show that the entanglement entropy of uh, either of the subsystems is basically equal to the thermodynamic entropy of the smaller system so that's essentially what we are reproducing here for the specific case of a hard sphere gas which is leaking from one box to the other so that's kind of a sanity check that we are finding the right answer at late times so let me this skip these two slides because they are really kind of not very important so um, so the so so essentially what i said is kind of what uh, is happening here as well so and the point is that so you don't ignore this part for now so this is a different calculation which i will explain which is kind of an interesting thing but this thing is this is the part that i was talking about so the early parts you get this result and at the late parts you get this result i want to emphasize that this is an actual calculation and an explicit flaw a lot of the page curves that you see in this business are schematic page curves but this is an actual calculation so what we are plotting on the x axis is basically the epoch okay so we are plotting it basically on epoch epoch basically means essentially the number of particles in each um, you know each in one box the num total number of particles is constant so you can keep track of each of those if uh, either of either of them and you find that the pay, you know the thing turns around at uh, some particular uh, time which we call the page time and you end up finding this okay so i'll explain the blue curve in a second uh, and i'm plotting this is the explicit plot for n equal to 3 which is the third renyi entropy 
but uh, so and for as the n becomes large there's only the plot becomes only more and more uh, well defined okay so that's all so this is the the ensemble average of the entanglement entanglement entropy uh, as a function of the epoch very directly gives you the page curve and the crucial point this would be a trivial result in a non gravitating system except for the fact that we are doing it using a semi classical calculation in which an ensemble average is showing up okay so if it is in a generic unitary system which is no information paradox this obviously you will get the page curve there's nothing surprising there but what is interesting here is that we are not doing it using a full unitary theory in which you know look uh, you know where we are exploiting its locality structure and all that so what we are really doing here is we are doing a semi classical calculation where the ensemble is playing a crucial role so this is a place where we are somehow going farther away from the unitary full description and still reproducing the page curve is sort of the point okay so now i'll explain how you can so 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 the remarkable thing about this in some sense is that if you are we are actually able to get an information paradox as well and there is a, so if so i'll tell you how you to get the information paradox here even though there is no horizon uh, so this is kind of what i just mentioned so you can ignore it so we can actually get an information paradox here and the key to that is basically this so if you compute the ensemble average at each epoch using the uh, of the density of the entropy then that object turns around but if if instead you compute the entanglement entropy of the ensemble average state the density matrix the de ensemble average of the density matrix then what you end up finding is that the you actually do find an information paradox this is again a direct result of the kind of calculations that i mentioned and again because i have uh, sort of run out of time uh, so let me so this is essentially the same sort of calculation so all i'm doing is that i'm actually doing the ensemble average first and then doing the squaring previously the square was inside so if i do that what ends up happening so the same sort of calculations happen um so let me just go here so the the only difference is that the object that i get so instead of this expression which contains this multiple pieces i only get this piece that's really the only difference that happens so i don't get this piece i only get this piece and this piece has the property that as time goes by or the epoch is increasing you end up finding that the quantity is just relentlessly increasing and uh, that's what you find here so that's essentially that's exactly what you find in the case of the standard page version of the hawking paradox where you compute uh, the hawking version of entanglement entropy it just relentlessly keeps increasing and you end up finding that it has uh, you know it tells you some result which is uh, uh you know which is contradictory to what you would expect from unitarity because if the page curve is not turning around looks like information is being lost and uh, and the final result that you get is also the entanglement entropy of the large box as opposed to the entanglement entropy of the small box which is what one would expect from um general expectations about um entangled systems so this is sort of the the so the end of sort of my technical thing and so um i mean uh, this, so the next i'll just now kind of have like a summary of the take away so to speak and so if you have any questions i think this is a good place to ask uh, what the question is yeah if anybody is still awake and not sleeping and so on okay so uh any questions if anybody have any question please ask so uh, the takeaway is basically that ensemble average and uh, ensemble average state uh, in a semi classical calculation gives you an information paradox ensemble average entanglement entropy uh, in the semi classical limit reproduces the page curve so that's the bottom line the punch line of uh, and we have done that in a system with no gravity in it and uh, we have reproduced both these features which are usually associated to problems with uh, uh, black holes okay so um so if there are no questions so let me just uh, summarize in some sense a long long summary so but in some sense maybe this is what is more interesting to people uh, than the calculation itself so the key observation about the calculation is that uh, the ensemble average of the berry ensemble at each epoch was key for getting the result and the existence of an epoch was crucial for us to use berry ensemble and also one more thing that we learned which is not obvious in the recent calculations in the black hole side is that the ensemble that we have is epoch dependent because the berry's ensemble that we are working with 
is the Berry's ensemble corresponding to NS particles on one side and NL particles on the, on the, in the large box side. So which means that since the NS is changing with each epoch, you have a different ensemble at each epoch. So that's in some sense the crucial difference from the JT gravity calculation where the ensemble is kind of hard coded into the picture and you're just computing uh, the page curve after an ensemble average, which is uh, you know, not epoch dependent. That's in some sense the difference with JT gravity. Um, so, so, and note also that our calculation is semi-classical. So, and yet we got the unitarity compatible page curve uh, um, when we did not average the state, of course. Yeah, so, and uh, even though I did not emphasize it, the detailed structure of our calculation can be organized in a way that is reminiscent of large and diagrammatics. And it has structural similarities. The calculation of this thing, the, the form of the calculations, once you get that Trace row tilde L I L type of expression that I wrote down is uh, very parallel to uh, JT gravity and even more parallel to a certain calculation done by Liu and Warden Hong Liu and uh, his student. And uh, essentially, the calculation, the, the the structure is more or less one to one. And uh, so, so in that sense, you know, once you get to that stage, the fact that we are able to reproduce the page curve is natural. And uh, perhaps one, uh, so the interesting thing in some sense is that the ensemble average state reproduces the information paradox as well, even though the system doesn't have gravity. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's what. So, the, mini, uh, the main takeaway for quantum gravity is that um, so an ensemble average semi classical page curve can be found in single realizations of quantum theories. So, the ensemble average and the semi classical page curve found in this uh, calculation of uh, Pennington, Schenker, Stanford, and Yang. Uh, and by Maldasen and company need not be related to the information paradox here. So in some sense, these two are logically independent issues and uh, it's, it stands to reason that it's uh, an ensemble average can be found in semi-classical gravity is nothing to do with the underlying ensemble average or not of a unitary quantum gravity. So ensemble average at the semi-classical level does not mean that the underlying fundamental theory need to be also an ensemble average. Our calculation is an explicit counterexample, even though it doesn't contain gravity. And uh, so the ensemble average is an effective ergodic proxy. So ergodic proxy means, you know, that's how you get uh, thermodynamics from um, uh, mechanics. So, so essentially what we are doing, whenever we are doing these ensemble averages at each epoch is we have sort of thinking of time averages as being replaced by these ensemble averages. And that's the underlying principle of uh, approach to equilibrium. And in that sense, these the ensembles that you're working with, the Berry's ensemble that we worked with, is an ergodic proxy for a time average during each quasi-equilibrium epoch. So perhaps, so this is, so now we are in the, and we'll make some speculations. So this suggests that the semi-classical gravity is a way to calculate ergodic averages for uh, bulk systems that are in local equilibrium. Okay, so when the gravitational system is approximately a local equilibrium system, and that's when semi-classical gravity or metric-based gravity is a useful description. Um, yeah, so that again brings back to the same idea, which is that quantum gravity need not be an explicit ensemble of distinct theories. Instead, it can be an ergodic proxy for quasi-equilibrium and I think that I have, uh, so there are a couple of slides which are kind of, I think, repetitive. So, um, yeah, so, so the reason why it works is again, because the time scale of Hawking temperature is, uh, in which Hawking temperature is constant, is, uh, is much larger than the sort of the thermalization time of the black hole, which you can think of as if you want as a scrambling time. Okay, and so one thing I should also say is that our proposals disagrees with the explicit ensemble interpretation that Busso and company have proposed. So, I mean, I should say that Busso has a paper titled Gravity Ensemble Duality, which um, it's, it's not completely clear what he means by that, because if you are, uh, so if, if gravity has to necessarily be a, uh, so in, in, if you read this paper, that statement is never uh, sufficiently clarified. So whether he is talking about the fundamental theories of ensemble average, or is he talking about uh, a semi-classical gravity, path integral should be thought of as an ensemble average, is not very clear. So if it is a fundamental theory, I think that is problematic because you know it would come to the conclusion that n equal for supreme angles is not really a theory of quantum gravity. And if you are talking about a semi-classical theory, semi-classical theory, you know, in higher dimensions is not a well-defined theory. So it's not very clear to me what he means by an ensemble average there. 
So, but if you take what I mean by you know, our proposal disagrees with this claim is that if you take the point of view that gravity, you know, quantum gravity is explicitly an ensemble average, then it disagrees with this picture, at least in higher dimensions. That's what I mean by that there. So, uh, and uh, so if I thought that maybe there was a question. Yeah, I just. This is the last slide. That, yeah. uh, that yeah. There are a few papers written by Clifford Johnson also recently. Yeah. He, yeah. They are also, he pointed uh, whatever he's, you are saying right now. But is it? Okay. He, so yeah. I was under the impression, I've kind of not been following uh, close attention to many of the JT gravity papers. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, JT gravity has an explicit ensemble average. And I think the more interesting question, I mean, or the later ones, I have been paying attention to the ones, you know, like maybe an year ago or so. So, mm -hmm. um, so like, uh, so the later ones I've not been paying close attention to, but I, but I do, I'm, I'm aware of the papers that you're mentioning. And uh, yeah, if he comes to the same conclusion, great. So, but I was not, you know, it's what is not clear to me is that in JT gravity, one can learn much more because JT gravity is automatically an ensemble average, you know? So it's not like, and that's, I, my claim is that somehow it's an artifact of low dimensions where a simple theory of gravity exists even at the metric level. So, yeah. but I think that if you go to higher dimensions, I think you'll really have to deal with uh, single realizations of unitary theories in which I think uh, it's unclear the the standard way in which the ensemble is supposed to arise in JT gravity, I don't think it is available there. So I think if we want this recent progress on information paradox to kind of be applicable more broadly, then I think you need to have a way of finding the ensemble in single realizations of unitary theories. Yeah, so that's the punchline. So, so yeah, so that's basically the end of my talk. Thank you. So thanks, Chetan, for the nice talk and uh, we have learned a lot of new things today and I am very hopeful that the students will be get the benefited out of this new contribution of yours. And uh, uh, this was the 77th uh, QSTM and uh, hopefully I will get back to you again in near future with some of your new ideas you can present again. And uh, yeah, like once this will be posted, I will give you, give, send you the link. Uh, that's, and uh, if anybody have any question, please ask. Um, I uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, 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 sure, absolutely. Please. Uh, so uh, what, what is the sufficient asking, condition? Before asking, before asking the question, I, ju I just request all the participants, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Chetan for giving such a nice talk. Oh, thank you. And now you can ask. Okay, so uh, what, what is the sufficient condition for Barry's conjecture? So I, yeah, so that's, uh, I think that's, it's not fully, um, well, so for instance, in the case when, uh, uh, the, if the thermal wavelength is less than, I don't think there are any proofs in this business. So let me start by saying that. So, but, if the thermal wavelength of the system, um, if the thermal wavelength of the system is is smaller than the, uh, you know, the microscopic structure scale, then you expect that uh, there is conjecture with both. So, for instance, in my case, for instance, you can define, you know, uh, uh, roughly speaking, h h by n k t. So, uh, sorry, h by k t. Uh, H by M, so, H, so let me try to remember. So it will be H cross squared by square root of H cross by square root of M K T would be e uh, less than or equal to the size of the sphere, which is A. So in that case, I expect uh, that's the uh, context in which, uh, um, for instance, Retnicki claims to uh, claims that uh, uh, you know this uh, various conjecture holds. So in the case of the hard sphere gas, there is a lot of numerical evidence that there is conjecture holes for high lying states. So, but I'm not sure that in a general system, there is a very sharp statement because most of this is uh, somewhat conjectural. So, and most, a lot of it is numerical, numerical evidence based, um, you know, so, but yeah. So the general expectation is what I said, which is that the thermal wavelength of the, uh, of th the thermal wavelength associated with these particles is basically less than the size of the particles. That's the answer. Well, uh, can, can you evaluate non-Gaussian correction to it? I'm interested in that because uh, uh, if we can see a non-Gaussian cor correction 
in case of jet gravity, then it might be interesting to see. I think that would roughly be uh, tantamount to seeing. Yeah, so, so in the case of, um, um, you know, JT gravity, the ensemble is, we know exactly what the ensemble is, right? So we know mm -hmm. what the, uh, the, the matrix models are. We know what the, the precise translation is. So, but in the case of a general system, what I would say is that knowing the deviation from that ensemble might be tantamount to seeing uh, non-equilibrium behavior uh, in, uh, in these settings. So it is basically the uh, approximately equivalent to that is what, that's my first thought. So, but yeah, I'm not too much of an expert on this. So, but yeah, so there is a lot of work on very, uh, so, so one of the things that has happened, I think that, so another thing that maybe I should sort of emphasize is that Berry's conjecture was kind of the starting point or the kind of the instigating idea behind eigenstate thermalization, at least in Sretniki's paper. But on the other hand, after that, it kind of has kind of receded into the background and eigenstate thermalization has kind of taken off as a separate thing. And people kind of phrase it purely in terms of expectation values on generic high-lying states. Okay, so the, the idea is that if you compute the expectation value in a high-lying state, it will basically look like a thermal expectation value. So that's the usual way in which the eigenstate of ETH is phrased. But I think that the way in which uh, Barry has phrased it, which is in terms of eigenfunctions of the system, is also of some interest. And what Srednicki really does is that he shows that the you know the stand the conventional the modern interpretation of eigenstate thermalization that the fact that small operators uh, their expectation values look thermal follows from Berry's uh, conjecture, which is basically a statement directly in terms of eigenfunctions. So um, so yeah, so that's I think that is a bit of a tangent, but so my uh, statement here is that yeah, so if if we can find a statement, uh, you know, if if we can find a deviation from the you know. Uh, 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 eigenstate uh, is the, this uh, Berry's conjecture, I would expect that it is basically tantamount to finding either fluctuations in an equilibrium system or uh, if, you, if it is in some specific configurations, maybe it is, uh, it is like, uh, you know, uh, non-equilibrium phenomena. So maybe those are the things that I can think of because it is, I, I, I don't think that semi-classical gravity is uh, uh, designed for cap capturing, you know, quantum gravitational fluctuations in the, at least in the full theory. So maybe in the, uh, in some toy models, one can do that, but uh, because it really requires a knowledge of the microphysics. Yeah, but that, that's Thank you. my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. There's probably more to be said there. Okay, Chetan, and uh, I'm uh, hopeful that you have also enjoyed to give this talk. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have nice asked to hear some questions. I was a bit worried there will be no questions. <laughs> no, I have asked so many elementary questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. So, like, stay safe and healthy, and like, maybe in near future we will get back to you again. Sounds and, good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Stay safe yourself. Yeah. Thank you. I can see Sachin in the background. I have, I've, I've, you know, yeah. I have, I, my, I have interacted with him a little bit. I said, Hello, sir. Fine, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure, sir. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye, Santan. Yeah. So, shall I sign off? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>